Professor Elizabeth Goodman from the University of East London's Smart Lab. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you all for your patience in the, the setup. I am, um, as I say in America, legally blind. So while I see very well um, to function in the world, um, hitting little tiny buttons is not what my lenses are tuned in for. So it really could take ages for me to do a simple, small thing. Big things are much easier. Um, so I'll just start. What I've done is prepared a, a video, which is exactly 35 minutes long, and I'll talk over it. And what it does is introduce what Smart Lab is, what our method is, how we evolved from the Open University BBC, and it was a fantastic introduction to have the previous talk there. A lot of what I'm going to address comes from our experience of working with the Open University for B uh, BBC for eight years and then evolving through other formats until we're co collaborating closely again with BBC R&D now. So I'll explain that, um, show you some examples of some of our main projects, one of which will be dancing live this evening in the theater across campus with two of our colleagues with severe cerebral palsy and some other disabled dancers and some virtual dancers. So I hope you'll all come to that, and I'll introduce that project briefly. But the main focus of my talk, which I called Building the Arc, is really about um, basically in recent years, I've, I've begun to describe the building of the Smart Lab PhD program as building an arc. <laughs> It's, it's a space, as, as the last part of this presentation will show, where it is safe to explore, create, collaborate, take time off, have a family, have children, be disabled, work in teams, not work in teams, get feedback from many different people, and continue your studies, um, whether one-to-many-to-many -to -many or one-to-one, -one, in whatever format works, and where the team will help you to create the technology tools to enable you to do whatever you need to do. Um, so that program has now been running our PhD program for 15 years. Our first graduate was from the Open University, um, linked to our BBC research there. We've now graduated 30 successful PhDs, all with a practical base to their work. Um, we'll just pause it for a second there, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Um, and we've got another current cohort of 35 students and a constant queue of people wanting to join the program. And I think it's because of our method, the way we work, and what we're trying to do with that practice-based PhD program. So that's where I'm going with this talk, and I hope that that's relevant to you. I thought it would be useful if I take you through the stages of what Smart Lab is, why we work in this mad way that's so hard to describe without the video, um, and introduce you to some of the key players, some of whom are across campus right now rehearsing as well. So that's the plan. I hope it makes sense. And I will just shout over top of this video, and I just need to know how to restart it again. Where's it? On this keyboard down here. Show me which keyboard you're using. Okay, cool. I'll shout over top. And where's the volume in case I need to bring it down? Okay, hopefully. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Yay. Okay. So I'm just going to start shouting over top of myself. Can you just drag it? Yeah, perfect. Can everybody see okay and hear okay? Sorry? Okay, sorry. Everybody can see in here? Don't be shy. Okay. Please don't be shy. Um, okay, so I'm going to start, and now I just need to know, sorry, on this machine, how to... Uh, goodness me. Is that the big button that makes it big? Woohoo! Okay. Um, so Smart Lab has a series of projects which have focused on bridging the digital divide over the years and our not-for-profit activism has linked closely with our research and knowledge exchange programs to provide a rich um, digital dividend pool too. I've described 30 practice-based PhDs, and you'll meet some of them now. Many of them are now our adjunct faculty. And so I want to focus on learning models, social networks, and community building um, from the three parts of the Smart Lab. Our symbol is the butterfly. The body and the mind are the central part of what we do um, in engaged performance practice. And this is my introduction to why we need to look at technology now. This is Nancy Griffiths singing. And she's singing about the world in which we currently live where there's too much media, where Facebook could take up your whole day, where you don't have time to go to LinkedIn and everybody's inviting you every five minutes, where you can't answer your mobile phone because it rings too often. And most importantly, you cannot pay attention to the people who are in the room with you when they're there, even when they're dying even when they really, really need your undivided attention because constantly we're all overwhelmed with all this media. And yet we choose to work in the field of media <laughs> and in the field of education and to try to unhijack ourselves and to take those tools and use them 
for co corporate social responsibility and education. And so our aim really is to bring those two things together and re-embrace the media, but to use it constructively and creatively in our own time for our own reasons and to connect us to people while they're physically with us. So my own book at the moment, um, finishing a few books for MIT Press, and my own is about presence and absence and how to remain present when technology wants to call you through the screen and what it means to have an absence, um, physical, emotional, or educational, and to come back to study. So this is our campus. We've been at, this is the University of East London. We've been there for three years this month. This is some of the core team. About a third of our team are disabled in various forms um, and have come through our performance technology programs. These are some examples. It's a very quick montage at the top of some of the work we've been doing over the past 15 years. This was in um, Budapest, um, in London for the European Commission. What we've been trying to do is create a new model of education which respects the individual creativity of every learner and every teacher as equals and that uses both technology and performance, including physical rehabilitation after severe injury as a form of performance or human movement to connect people um, in a whole variety of projects. And in any project or event like this that we ran for the European Commission, um, these kinds of projects, the aim is not to have the technology take over, but to have Fiona or some of our artistic colleagues working equally, as equals, with the robot developer and with the person who has lost her leg to create something together, all of them contributing equally to some shared joint project from which all of the others learn. That's what we're trying to do. Um, so this is my group in New York, the Budapest group. We've set up sites all over the world just because people want to work with us, so we're just setting up sister sites, all of which are for free. We operate as a not-for-profit, so, so long as we can afford to bring a team and set up, we give away everything that we do. Um, and I'll come back to that model in a minute. This is our main studio at um, University of East London where we do some of these knowledge cafes where creative um, business professionals and corporate social responsibility leaders from industry come in to meet individual students who get to pitch their PhD proposal to someone who might fund not only that but the whole project around it for the next three to five to ten years or who might build a team. And these are some of the previous students who are now all adjunct faculty members. So, for instance, Daria Dorish, who you just saw there, was dean of the Fashion Institute in New York for 20 years, but had never had time in her life to do a PhD, and she came to do it with us part-time and is now a faculty member leading other mature students, largely women, in this way. So the question is, how can we ensure that all community sectors engage creatively and positively with business so that business begins to fund education in a real way from the ground up? Um, so, for instance, Google wanted a group of women technologists to talk about what Google could do to celebrate women's achievements, but also to get more women involved. And this woman, Safna Ramnani, who's a filmmaker who makes gorgeous films, but who has previously had to have her helpers help her to edit them because she has severe cerebral palsy. We're working with Mick, the man who's across campus rehearsing right now, to create a system where Safna can edit herself. So linking the eye gaze system to Final Cut Pro so that Safna will control her own learning and her own creative expression. There's a range of projects, and all I'm going to do now is introduce some of them and, and why we work this way. So we explore issues in terms of artist business technology, and we def the group defines themselves as explorers, or um, uh, sometimes they call themselves pirates or gypsy scholars, and they call me their choreographer of creative chaos, um, meaning that we work in physical ways, everyone of whatever level of physical ability, and some of these people you're looking at here are blind, but we move and we make sure that it's safe for everyone to move first, and then we move together. Some of these performers here in our Singapore studio are blind, others are deaf. Bobby here, my main dance partner who's performing this evening, you'll see, has a very unusual arm and so a different counterbalance technique in his dance. And in all of this work, what we're teaching in these exercises is how to trust each other and how to make sure it's safe to trust each other before you start to share your ideas. And before you, what the students here in New York are doing are creating their ways of moving, which then inform their avatars, which are their virtual learners, which we then put into the virtual learning environment. But first we embody it, so that there's never a moment when you just leap into some virtual world and you don't really know who's in there with you or how they move or how they think or whether you would choose to be with them in person. First we make sure there's some connection. So a lot of what we do is physical techniques. Every morning of a seminar, everyone gets involved. The computer engineers and the architects and the city planners and the medical doctors dance and jump and sing and shout. 
with all the performers and the performers have to sit down and learn a bit of coding or at least what it means to code and how to build a, a mock-up or a maquillette or a, how to install um, some technology and some fashion so that everyone understands each other's space before they share a space. So this is one of our biggest projects called Club Tech. It's just changed its name to Smart, uh, Smart Clubs this year at Microsoft's request. It's the, the first project that we accepted from Microsoft and we were we were very wary about it. I'll let you hear. So 5.3 million of the poorest kids in America have, have used that program now for five years, and we're bringing it to Europe next month. Um, London will be the first base, but we're looking for partners. And then next year, we roll out through the Euro Europe, Middle East, and Africa. So if anyone's interested in that, we have an adult version now, and we're focusing now on teens. Cyber Cafe project that uses the power of new technologies to help stop violence against women and children. As part of a women's study program, SafetyNet quietly links women and children to critical information about domestic violence through online access. Specialized e-learning centers allow participants to safely communicate with domestic violence specialists, volunteer attorneys, survivors, and mentors in secure and moderated chat environments. Due to the development of new technologies, a digital bridge called SafetyNet was created to address an old problem in a new way. SafetyNet offers participants easy, low-cost, anonymous access to information and domestic violence advocacy. SafetyNet has no borders, live or online, and is inclusive, non-discriminatory, sensitive to all ages, geographical locations, economic and ethnic groups, gender, sexual orientation, physical abilities, and languages. The Safety Net Project encourages the active involvement of women, men, and children. Safety Net's team has developed 
but prototype, including two major lines of safety wear clothing and accessories, incorporating capabilities for safety and communication sensing via GPS, Bluetooth, microchip, and smart card technology. We hope to work on site in local shelters to enable women to use local materials, fabrics, and traditional skills to make fashion items for sale via the web, thereby empowering women's freedom through economic self-sustainability and also producing a range of locally made garments ready for insertion of the safety net technology systems for those in need. Our fashion lines have been featured at the prestigious Seagraph Cyber Fashion Shows for two years running. At the 2004 International Computer Interactive Conference, our team was one of only five groups invited to showcase its cyber fashions. And in 2005, we took pride of place amongst the teams having made major strides for fashion and women's rights. Our team is always expanding, and our ideas and energy are limitless. But our resources dictate the speed and efficacy of our efforts, and women and children are being heard in every country, in every street, at all times. Right now, somebody very near you needs help. Help us to hear that silent call, and help us to respond. Please donate generously, and help us to help stop violence against women and children. Say stop to violence, they go to safety. I'll come back at the end of these case studies to what I think this has to do with the state of education and how we can better use technology in Thank PhD you. programs. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of the women you saw in that video and who have been part of Safety Net for 15 years helped us to invent one of the online learning tools that we're using now, which started at the Open University BBC. Um, and, but it took a group of women who had real, very specific um, physical need for safety to teach us how best to use a tool we had made for standard learners and to roll it out for free around the world so that people could tell their story. So I'll come back to that. The next project is linked to the one that you'll see this evening if you come to the show. It's also about helping people to speak when they normally can't do so, but it's for people who have no physical voice, in this case because of advanced cerebral palsy, but it could be any condition. Um, in this particular case, we're looking at the interface of the MyToby screen, which my colleague Mick will introduce. Uh, it's uh, basically it's an eye control system, which means that you can um, control the computer with your eyes. It's not just like reading your eye movements, you're able to actually make things happen on the screen. And the idea is that if you find the right way in, the right interface for someone with a disability, they can do anything on the computer that anyone else can. The difficulty is finding the right interface. Those are my eyes there, and this particular system will let me move my head uh, and still pick up my eye movement. So even if I have a physical disability that means that I move backwards and forwards and sideways, it'll still pick up my eye movement. So for people with a range of disabilities, this kind of technology can enable them to be able to communicate and control the computer very, very successfully and directly. Basically, we're working very closely with James, and we're doing what he, what, what he wants us to do. And what he wants to do is he wants to be able to write more quickly, to be able to communicate more quickly and effectively, and that's partly why one of the aspects of the way in which he wants to communicate is through music, and as well as his poetry, and uh, um, also we'll be able to enable him to design as well, so that he has the full opportunity as have the rest of us to express themselves. You can't say, you can't guarantee that if someone is eye like control, which might have been physically, you can't say that. What you have to do is you have to try and set the system as well as you possibly can for them, and then say, how does it feel? And so far, from the way that, the work that we've done so far, James actually feels that for him, it's less effort. So, I'll turn down the volume just to shout over the music for a minute, so. What you're seeing here is James leading a, a jam. So for a 32-year-old guy who had never been able to play music or speak, James is now able to, using his eyes, play tracks of music that he has helped to write with the musicians we work with who've recorded specially what he wanted, the, the instruments, what he chose over three years we've been working together to create a score, like an emotional lexicon that en enables James to have a range of emotional registers to his voice, Woody Allen or someone else, or as you see here, a chance to riff live in a musical scenario with professional musicians where James is leading. So Magic Hyperwitz here, 
responds to James leading. And as James looks at the sax or the trombone or whatever he's playing, that's the, the sound that comes out at the level he chooses. As he stares at the screen and dwells his eyes, that, that's the music and the musician's response. So we'll be, we'll be performing that live in a duet this evening as part of our show, if you want to come. But beyond the music, it's a way to express yourself creatively. And by using that system, we're enabling James to write a book with us for MIT Press, which is about just-in-time technologies and even way too late technologies. Um, why has it taken to the age of 32 before James could tell us anything? And why is Katie, who you're about to meet here, this is Katie Gilligan, who's also dancing this evening, um, is 24. And tonight, for the very first time anywhere, she will speak herself in real time. So <laughs> do come to that. Um, she's an amazing lady. And why, at the age of 24, is tonight the first time she's going to speak? herself. That's way, way, way too late technology because all the tools existed. They were used for marketing and we figured out or our team figured out how to take the stuff that people use to figure out how can you sell more Coca-Cola or, I don't know, surf detergent by tracking where people's eyes are on, on big um, billboards and how can you make those systems smaller and then use them for education and communication. So Mick is behind all of that. This is our BBC R&D project of the moment. We've Always had one since we left the Beeb, and my colleague Camille, who's also performing this evening, will introduce it. So Camille's PhD is based on this project called Mind Touch, about finding new ways to communicate via mobile phones. I'm Camille Baker. I'm a PhD student at the Smart Lab um, Institute, and I'm looking at using mobile devices um, to and the meta concepts I'm using for my projects involve uh, looking at the qualities and sensations of liveness and presence in mobile performance projects, and if they exist or if they're anything different from internet-based performance projects. And uh, from this metaphor, I'm creating a participatory uh, performance installation or series of performance installations um, that play with this idea of um, the mobile network and presence. Well, there's three stages of the project, and I will go through them. Um, but I want to talk about the metaphor that guides the project. And the metaphor is the idea of if you could share your dreams, your physical embodied dreams when you wake up in the morning with your friends, family, your lovers, etc. How could you do that? And I'm trying to create a simulation of that um, kind of experience or exchange. The idea being, if I could wake up and um, exchange my dream with someone telepathically and share the physical and visual um, elements of that dream, how could I do that? And maybe how could I collaborate with someone else and expand or explore the dream? The simulation is creating um, a connection between mobile phones, but capturing and sharing visual or video um, embodied uh, experiences through the phones, and also incorporating biofeedback sensors that can um, capture breath, uh, pulse, skin reactions, and muscle activity to also share perceptions of the body. This is Bobby, who will be dancing with us this evening and choreograph this piece. So I can't go on too much more about those particular case studies, except to say I hope you get the point that those and 45 other projects running at the moment and loads of archival projects are all about how do we encounter, how do we create better new virtual worlds, better than Second Life, safer than Second Life, cheaper than Olive, um, more customizable than anything out there, playable on mobile phones, um, usable in, in the developing world for free if need be, provided for free to those who need it for communication or healing or meditation, but certainly for physical uh, rehabilitation, and to the elderly, which is our other main user group I haven't spoken about. So together we try to bring business and education together um, to create sustainable growth models for educational tools development. And we do that through a group of people working together in what we call the magic lab. So our main playroom, and we call it the playroom in our new studios, is the Multimedia and Games Innovation Center. 
And our aim there is to make rapid prototyping tools available for free to people who've never had access to technology before and to see what they'll make. So some of these 2D to 3D prototyping tools where you can print out a whole sculpture or a, a replica or a model of something. We've bought all those tools, but unlike other programs that um, only provide them if you sign up to some university's IP contract, <laughs> I'm not naming names, let's just say we don't do that. Anyone can come and use these tools whenever they want to and um, be trained in the technology. So school kids, um, Bengali women's groups where we work, a lot of disabled people, fashion designers who want to figure out how to install technology into garments and, and objects and handbags, and engineers who want to prototype things cheaply before they build big scalable models. So Toby Borland, who you'll also meet this evening, um, who runs this, is an engineer um, who created the world's most accurate sundial as part of his PhD project who's a sculptor and engineer who brings those two bodies of knowledge together with a love for young kids and, and he was homeless himself for a long time and with a, an understanding of what it means to enable people, often homeless people or people who've been disenfranchised in some very real way, perhaps for a very long time, to feel comfortable in a space and safe in a space to ask questions and to try out new ideas. So these are some examples of what Toby and Jerry here and the rest of the team have made in the lab. And what we're doing next is, as, as the new development of the, the Microsoft project, to leap backwards, um, Microsoft has given us permission to open source all of the tools that we've been using in the Microsoft project and to add in all our open source tools and send them out as a free package to any club that can set up. So <laughs> there's Toby, the mad inventor. So the idea is scalability and then to test what people learn. And finally, I come to our PhD program. So it's the last 10 minutes you'll be pleased to hear. And you will have seen some of this footage before, but I want you to see how the same people involved in those projects and lots of other projects in both of our wings, the Creative Industries wing and the not-for-profit Safety Net Trust Kids in Hospital Charity wing work together through this shared space to achieve their own PhDs, but to work in teams who are also achieving larger social goals that have to do with technology. And the other user group I haven't spoken about is Aboriginal communities. When I talk about the program lately, I've begun to describe it as an ark or a ship or a vessel. And that's not only because of the impact of global warming on a country otherwise known for a great deal of rain. <laughs> So we offer individualized programs of study where every student gets at least three supervisors from different disciplines and an online space for constant communication and feedback, which is monitored and safe for them and co-created by them as an open source tool. Um, and where students live all over the world and engage in their full-time practice all over the world, but join us three times a year in London for really intensive weeks of group critique and feedback, and then once a month online, and as often as they want to otherwise, but that's the bare the bare minimum. Um, we have three main clusters, performance technologies, virtual worlds, and assistive technology, including robotics. But there are now 15 smaller research groups under those, and they, they cross-pollinate all the time. And basically, we're an ethically committed, socially committed, and engaged technology transfer unit, a research center trying to make an impact locally, one-to-one, -one, and then globally through those two wings. Chartable destination or course that makes stops in unlikely places around the world with the aim of finding and gathering the smartest, most creative, and socially engaged people who could, if brought on board together, make a real and lasting contribution not only to the world of scholarship but also to a future world not yet invented. Smart Lab first set sail from the BBC Open University studios some 15 years ago with a new style of practice based PhD with specific aims and objectives that are transformative. Hence, the logo on the side of our ship is the butterfly, the ultimate symbol of transformation, intellectual, physical, and social. Glasgow and my PhD was on representations of women from uh, the 1890s to the first world. <coughs> Basically, you're going to meet some of the faculty in real form and virtual form. Admission to the program and many 
many qualified scholars for every place we can offer. But we also seek out and handpick exceptional candidates from non-traditional backgrounds and bring those people together with high-level scholars in teams to address social, academic, and technological issues and ideas together. PhD at the University of Surrey was on the effect of new technologies and anti-philosophy on dance discourse. By working in this way, we ensure that each student completes a highly original PhD and also that the nature of the PhD process grows and is informed by a transdisciplinary team spirit respecting both theory and practice. Many of our students are themselves senior professionals with many years of experience in academia and the creative industries. They come on board the Smart Lab ARC three times a year for intensive collaboration and group critique, and throughout the year they also inhabit a real and virtual safe space system for creative exchange. At Chris Hales, I recently did my PhD based on the creation of innovative interactive movies by the making of them and the testing of them with audiences. We aim not only to support each individual to complete a highly original PhD, but also to contribute as a group to the future of the PhD degree itself. The Smart Lab ARC is thus a place where preserving the best of the old tried and tested modes of research, which can be carried to new lands, and of co-inventing the most exciting and sustainable new research models for the next generations too. The Smart Lab Arc moves from place to place and has traveled through four universities since we launched and has set up many collaborative sister sites too. As my current student, I work at Smart Labs, my PhD, was on cultural representations of warfare, in particular the First World War, but you'd be surprised how relevant it is. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly done here, and then I'll wrap up. So it's about independent research, uh, combining high-level scholarship journey, and activism. Creatives with unusual backgrounds and abilities and talents, who, if brought aboard at the right time with the right support, alongside top scholars from complementary fields, could invent new ideas and new ways of working. So we operate a buddy system, whereby both students and faculty work in teams across and between disciplines. This is the key to the program's success. Our basic aim with the PhD is to provide the highest quality, most intensive and supportive environment for interdisciplinary groups to undertake their research, each with a single unique project leading to a PhD, but each contributing to the group's higher knowledge too, so that each cohort completing contributes more than the sum of the parts. The easiest way to explain our program is to say briefly what it is not. It is not a standard UK PhD, where a student might go for years without supervision or feedback, and might have people named on the supervisory team who are not experts in the field, nor committed to the student or the project. It is not a lonely solo enterprise of academic study in an ivory tower. It is not a program that runs Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 p.m. We work flexibly across seven days of the week and evenings too, as some of our team will always be rising somewhere in the world as others are heading home for the evening in London. My name is Anna Birch, and I'm looking at um, gender in live and mediated performance. The art respects time zones and everyone's right to equal engagement from all over the world. What Smart Lab is, it is a meeting place for the minds and a space for exchange between performance and technology, scholarship and professional practice. It is a place where theatre games inform everything we do as they return us all to that state of unselfconscious experimentation that opens the mind to new thoughts and new ways of thinking. Smart Lab is thus more than a research centre. It is a community, a family of scholars who are travellers, thinkers, makers and doers, and you share the aim of inventing new modes of being that care for the world and for all the people in it. In both real space and in our virtual environments, our symbolic arc has taken the form of a pirate ship, a symbol for our social model of borrowing from the rich, who are often in industry, and giving to the poor, 
who are often artists. Or, in a more politically correct wording, we have an ethos of sharing the world's riches in terms of access to the knowledge economy and of sharing that wealth from within. Many of the Smart Lab graduates return to the fold as adjunct faculty with a wish to share their knowledge and their energy and understanding of our community model with the next generation of scholars. I'm very proud of the Smart Lab family, all its generations and its newest arrivals too. This is not a pride of ownership, but of inspiration. Each new student and each new faculty member comes to the team, which in the arc, carrying knowledge and talent and a deep sense of caring. This last requirement is the most important part of the admissions process. All the smart people in the world could not achieve the social and educational transformations that the world requires without that deep and profound social commitment being highlighted and developed together as part of the scholarly process. It's a privilege to work with each and every Smart Lab student and with all of the faculty and to learn from them as well as with them on each stop on our journey, live and online. Until we meet again. Just while the credits play, just one minute. I, I don't want to run over, but um, I think that the most important point, and it was fantastic that we had the BBC presentation first. For me, the reason I started this program, not only because I didn't have supervision for my own PhD, and it was a lonely enterprise with no feedback whatsoever, and I decided to create a program where no one else would have to go through that. But more importantly, technology has changed in the past 15 years, and many of the students you've seen, and many of you, I'm sure, have helped to change it to the point where when my first Shakespeare lecture for Open University BBC, I was told one day that you know, my books were Routledge bestsellers and the videos were selling and the British Council was sending them all over the world and there were 6,000 registered students but 6.5 million drop-in viewers for the lectures that we were doing. And I thought for a minute, that's fantastic. And then I thought, it really isn't because how do I know whether they understand what's happening? It was before the days of interactive media. So 6.5 million people who you couldn't look in the eyes and say, did you get that or should I repeat? Or do you need to see that from a different angle? Or should I explain again with a different example? And that's why we founded Smart Lab. We set up BBC Interactive Media Group in the Shakespeare course first and then in other parts of the Open University. And we started working together with BBC engineers who still work with us today on creating tools where people could tell their stories. And so I hope it hasn't seemed like a, a totally unconnected story to us for 15 years, that same team who helped me make the first BBC interactive program, which then you know, got a lot of attention from BAFTA and the rest of it. We then just took that tool and stripped it down to the barest bones in our free time, and I took it to all the women's shelters where I was working. And those women told us how they needed to use it for instant translation, for private communication, for storytelling of a very different kind with a social need. And then we began to understand how disabled people, Aboriginal people, and all kinds of other communities need these tools, one to one first, and then one to many, many. So I hope that makes some sense to you, and I'm very happy to tell anybody more about it. And please do come to the show. All these amazing people are over across the campus. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, but we're almost out of time, and it's my job <laughs> to keep us to time. Have we got just one question for the please? Or are you all blown away? Shall I say, we are going to take questions after the show this evening if you do come from the whole team. So if you have questions after, do you? Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very Did much you for coming to the session. Right. Oh, we have one Can question. Can we take one? Bob, please. please. Um, all the universities in the world ran PhDs, you know, more like the, the art that you've, you've described. I mean, do, do you think it's extensible to other universities, or is there some very, very special magic that can't be taken and replicated away from Smart Lab? No, and I think, um, you know, maybe I, I shouldn't say that. The business model dictates that I should not say that, but the fact is I think that, of course, we all do this, and I'm sure all of you with your students care just as much as I do about about mine and give just as much. And caring is the social glue that makes the whole thing work. But it is sustainable and, and strategically we have remained independent. So since we left the Open University, we've been an independent organization based at the University of Surrey and then based at Central St. Martins and now based at University of East London, working closely and respecting those institutions but able to move and therefore able to maintain an open source policy, um, develop it, work with industry and, and grow. So we do now have formal smart lab programs in New York, LA, 
and as of next week, Cairo and Dubai. And what's interesting is, is not only how many sites want to develop a smart lab, but the very different social needs. And we, one thing I haven't said is we began largely as a women's team. For a long time, both the faculty and the students were all women, apart from Chris Hales, who was our honorary man for a long time. And that was not a strategic choice. It happened, and it happened because the people attracted to our flexible time frame and the fact that you could bring your kids to the seminars if you needed to and all the other things that fit in with women's lives um, fit, but also that there was an awful lot of communication and social theory as well as educational theory informing what we were doing, and the women were drawn to it at first. Now we're almost 50% um, men and a, a big mix of people, but we're constantly surprised by the new groups of people who ask, could we set up a smart lab and what would that be? So it, I think it's totally scalable. Great. Well, thank you so much to both our speakers. I've been totally entranced, and I'm really sorry that I'm the person who has to keep us the time here and <laughs> push us away. Thanks. <laughs> All powerful Elizabeth and Smart Lab as well. Thank you. And great thanks to the BBC.